The order of service is Divine Service Setting 4, page 203. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, 
you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Mercifully grant that we may follow the example of his great humility and patience and be made partakers of his resurrection. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> The Old Testament reading for the Sunday of the Passion, or Palm Sunday, is from Zechariah, chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Philippians, chapter 2. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not account equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 12th chapter. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, 
the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show but what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, <clears throat> and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.
Our text for our sermon today is John chapter 12, 20 to 43, the gospel lesson just read. The sermon title is, What Kind of King Is This? Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when the President of the United States comes to town, it's always a big deal. At the end of last year, you may remember, our local historical landmark, the Filoli Estate, was the setting for a diplomatic summit between President Joe Biden and President Xi Jinping of China. Biden arrived via the normal mode of transport, Air Force One, a highly modified Boeing 747. All that plain for just one man. Air Force One is always accompanied by fighter jets, the latest, the fastest, and the most deadly, to protect the president from terrorists and other dangers. When Air Force lands, as it did at San Francisco, oh, uh, SFO International, it taxis into a cordoned off area where only dignitaries and press are allowed. When the jet stops, a jetway is rolled up, the red carpet is rolled out, and the president's limo drives up. When the doors of the airplane open and the president is ready to disembark, the local band strikes up the tune. Hail to the chief. Da, 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 You've heard it before. I don't need to sing it for you. You could almost sing it for me. No, you're not going to do that. Okay. <laughs> then the president walks out on the jetway. He waves to the crowd, shakes the hands of the local dignitaries, and steps into the limousine, or sometimes into a helicopter, Marine One. If it's a limo, the motorcade then heads out of the airport, surrounded by police officers on motorcycles and squad cars, heading for whatever business brought him to town. The arrival of the commander-in-chief has always been a big deal throughout history. The events that we celebrate this Palm Sunday are, in that sense, just part of the perennial parade of rulers that mark the arrival, ascent, and decline of dynasties, regimes, and governments. But this parade into Jerusalem was different because its king was different. He did not come with armies and cavalry to conquer Jerusalem, nor did he come with mobs to infiltrate, subvert, or start revolution. Jesus just came to attend the Passover festival and preach about his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. What kind of kingdom was this kingdom of heaven that he always talked about everywhere he went? Perhaps it is easier to say what it was not than what it is. It was not a real political kingdom such as the Roman Empire of the day or the United States today. It was not a military kingdom in the sense of armies, ammunition, supplies, and machinery ruled over by a military general. It was not a business kingdom that we have here in our country in the sense of real estate, facilities, equipment, personnel, buying and selling, and ruled over by a chief executive officer, CEO. It was not an academic kingdom in the sense of faculty and staff and libraries, classrooms, gymnasium, and dormitories ruled over by a president and board of regents. Jesus' kingdom was none of these, and his kingdom was not even a religious kingdom in the sense of a temple with priests, daily and festival sacrifices, property and taxes to pay for all of that. 
nor was it a modern religious kingdom in the sense of what we see today. Church buildings, pastors, schools, properties, assets, offerings, and donations to pay for all of that. All that Jesus could claim as his own, at least what was obvious and visible, were the clothes on his back, the 12 apostles, a few other faithful followers, and a couple of women who supported them all financially. Even the vehicle he chose for his entrance was borrowed. It was not his own. Speaking of his vehicle, you know how we like to talk about our cars. Let's talk about Jesus' car. Well, as a beast of burden, a donkey is about as low as you can go. In the ancient world, it was equivalent to the East German Trabant, nicknamed the Trabi. Some of you may know what I'm talking about. Donkeys are not much bigger than the largest dog. They have a worldwide reputation for being stubborn. I've seen pictures of children riding donkeys, but never an adult. When the donkey gets overloaded or tired, it just stops. Maybe some of you have raised donkeys and know their character. I don't suspect that an adult will get very far if they try to ride a donkey. And the donkey will even laugh at you if you try. Our gospel lesson tells us that Jesus chose the mother donkey and its colt as his vehicles for entrance into Jerusalem. The text for the Palm Sunday narrative says that Jesus rode on both of them. And I don't think that works trying to juggle between the two at the same time. I think it means he rode the mare, and when she got tired and slowed down, he dismounted and got on the colt for a while. It must have been an older colt. And when the colt got tired, he got back onto the mare. And he went back and forth until the parade was done. Now this was hardly an efficient means of transport. And it may have looked somewhat ludicrous. Why did Jesus choose this strange means of transport for parade? Well, for one, because nobody had ever tried to enter Jerusalem this way. It was unique. And it was because, since no one else had done it, it was completely unique in the history of Jerusalem. Nobody, I mean, this was a one time in the entire history of Jerusalem, and that goes back before the time of King David. And Jesus had that intent. It was because the prophet Zechariah, our Old Testament lesson, foretold exactly this scene. Zechariah 9 9, namely that the king of Jerusalem would come riding on a mother donkey in a colt. By entering Jerusalem this way, Jesus claimed that lesson, Zechariah 9, for himself. And he was saying something. It was a big statement. You have it in your handout. Look at that if you need to. See what it says. That's what he was saying by riding the colt. That was his choice. It was just like when Jesus claimed Isaiah 49, 8-9 for himself at the synagogue in Capernaum, which said, quote, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anoint, has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. So by entering on a donkey and its colt, Jesus claimed to be the king of the Jews on the basis of Zechariah 9, verse 9. Well, there's donkeys. And then there's the other side of that species or genus. Have you ever seen a king's horse? Carla, the girls, and I did many years ago. We took two days for a spring break for a short trip to Kentucky. One of our stops was Churchill Downs in Louisville, where the Kentucky Derby is held every year in May. And they're already out there buying their hats, I can tell you. 
While we were visiting the Downs, and we were still in the parking lot, we saw a trainer walk by with the reins of a real thoroughbred racer in her right hand, and the reins of the horse's stable mate, a small pony, in the other hand. We all looked, and I stared. I'd never realized that thoroughbreds were so tall, and their legs so long. This particular horse was spirited, had a bouncy gait, and he often nuzzled his trainer. You could tell that that horse was designed and built to run. He was a horse fit for a king. And yet Jesus rode a donkey. What kind of king was Jesus anyway? He was not a worldly king in any sense of the term king. Worldly rulers of all sorts are concerned about governing lands, governing subjects, acquiring money and property, becoming rich and powerful, all for the present day, for their lifetime. Jesus, on the other hand, wants you to know how you can inherit the kingdom of heaven, how you can be saved from eternal death, and how you can become eternally rich, all for the future time, so that you may enter heaven when you die. In heaven, eating, drinking, and working to sustain life will no longer be necessary. In heaven, your bodies will be more beautiful and handsome than anything on earth. In heaven, no one will be sad, weak, sick, but everlastingly healthy, happy, strong, and vigorous. And that's Jesus' kingdom, which he brings the news of to you and to all people. In Jesus' kingdom and through his word, Jesus teaches that you are a poor lost sinner and that you are condemned to die if you didn't know that and that you are by nature under constant attack or influence by Satan. Jesus also teaches you that through his death and blood, he has redeemed you from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil so that by faith in him, you are in God's sight righteous and blessed forever. This is a completely different teaching and wisdom and insight than what is offered by human reason, by legal experts and the intelligentsia of the world. By coming into Jerusalem on a donkey and its colt, Jesus told the Jews, the world and you, that his kingdom is really different. His spiritual kingdom is found today wherever his word is preached, taught, and read, wherever his sacraments are properly administered. And where these things happen, God sends his Holy Spirit to create faith in human hearts and to add new members to Jesus' kingdom. Jesus' kingdom is a spiritual kingdom because it is governed by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, spiritual kingdom, and it moves the hearts and spirits of men to have faith, hope, and love, and other fruits of the Spirit. Therefore, you should always remember the difference between Jesus' kingdom and the kingdoms of this earth, just as he clearly demonstrated that difference by riding into Jerusalem on a donkey and a colt, not on a king's thoroughbred horse or Air Force One. In our Savior's name, amen. The peace of God which passes understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Please stand for the prayers. <clears throat> <clears throat> In our prayers today, we pray for D. Estri, who recently suffered serious injuries when a car hit her while she was walking in a pedestrian crosswalk. D. is a friend of David and Barb Smoot. We pray for Fausto Jacopo, the brother-in-law of Sandy Shanks, whose health has declined and is in serious condition. 
We pray for Dan Moore, a friend of David and Barb Smoot, who recently had surgery and will be undergoing treatments for the next six weeks. We continue to pray for our members, Alice Bershinger, Fred McKenna, Sandy Shanks, Jessica Shanks, Sue Bethke, and Cindy Gonzalez. Other petitions continue for Al Smoot, the brother of David Smoot, Debbie Strom, sister-in-law of Chris Strom, and Jennifer James, the sister of Sue Bethke. We continue to pray for peace in the world and for the rulers of our nation. Let us pray. O Father of mercies and God of all comfort, our only help in time of need, look with favor upon your servants whom we have named in your presence. Mercifully help others struggling with addiction. Assure all these pe persons of your mercy, deliver them from the temptations of the evil one, and give them patience and comfort in their illness. If it please you, restore them to health or give them grace to accept these tribulations with courage and hope through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, God of all concord, it is your gracious will that your children on earth live together in harmony and peace. Defeat the plans of all who would stir up violence and strife, and according to your will, end all conflicts in the world. Teach us to examine our own hearts, that we may recognize our own inclination toward envy, malice, hatred, and enmity, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and most merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, grant health and prosperity to all who are in authority, especially to the President and Congress of the United States, the Governor and Legislature of California, and to all those who make, administer, enforce, and judge our laws. Grant them grace to rule according to your good pleasure for the maintenance of righteousness and the hindrance and punishment of wickedness, so that we may lead quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and honesty. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the offering. stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. 
Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Lord God of Sabbath, the door, earth the full acclaim, shout the glory of your name, sing O Son of Santa to the Lord, truly blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. At your command, Abraham prepared to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice on the mountain. Yet in mercy you provided a ram as a substitute. We give you thanks that on Calvary you spared not your only son, but sent him to offer his life as a ransom for many. As we eat and drink his blood, grant us like Abraham our father to trust in your promise, now fulfilled in Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Hear us as we pray in his name, and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Now shall ever be our 
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you've refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 441. You may be seated. This week, as you know, is Holy Week. And in observance, we have special services throughout the week. This morning, we have Bible class at, uh, after service, after coffee hour. Uh, we're studying the book of Leviticus in the library. Tuesday Bible class uh, continues the work on 2 Timothy at 9. Quilters meet at 10. Thursday, there's no Wednesday service this week. Thursday is Monday Thursday with Holy Communion. It begins at 5.30 p.m. Please put that time on your calendar. We've had other times for that date. This year it's 5.30. Good Friday service is also at 5.30. That is not communion, it's a Good Friday service. Next Sunday, also a different time. All that's on this page, so save it if you can't remember it. Uh, Easter service will be at 10 a.m. It's preceded by Easter breakfast from 8.30 to 9.30. So all that is on the bulletin. Um, please keep that as a reminder. I know it may be confusing because it's not our normal time, but just realize it is Holy Week and we do things a little different. So uh, I don't think there's any other announcements I need to make, so may God bless your week. Mm -hmm.